Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Today we are once again looking at the stuff passed to the developers in January of 2020 and after going over pretty much everything we are left with the last topic and of course the last topic is helicopters. So there are three articles for us to go to, we're going to have a look at them and see what is going on. The first one is from Piev and he's talking about Sikorsky's S67 Blackhawk. Now this is a really cool uh, machine which has an interesting story behind it but unfortunately nothing really came out of it, at least from the S67 point of view. So it all starts from an actual delayed program. Uh, the Armed Aerial Fire Support System program was delayed, and Sikorsky offered an armed version of the SH-3C King uh, for that program, which was the S61. And following more issues uh, with this program, uh, the company developed an intermediate and high-speed attack aircraft called the Sikorsky S67 Blackhawk in 1970, and this is of course the machine that you see before you. Uh, the design work on the S67 began in November 1969 with the next uh, fabrication on top of you know what uh, it was already seen in February 1970. The Blackhawk then flew for the first time in the 20th of August 1970, so it was a pretty quick turnaround for this machine after the initial plans were out there. So the S67 overall was a uh, five-bladed main rotor and uh, also had a the tail rotor. The main rotor was removed from the S61, but it was modified to have a hub fairing swept from the main rotor blades and also a special Alpha 1 connection that was added to the main rotor controls to increase the collective pitch sensitivity. Uh, the scope of the collective <clears throat> the pitch uh, sensitivity of the scope of the collective pitch. The 20 degree uh, main rotor blade tips uh, help to overcome a phenomenon called a sub multiple oscillating track and that causes variations in the tip track in high Mach numbers. Uh, this allowed the S67 to reach maintain high cruising speeds compared to some of its counterparts and also to reduce drag at high speeds. The main wheels were completely retracted from the front wing sponsor, uh, sponsors. It had uh, speed brakes on the uh, trailing edges of the wings uh, that could be used to slow or increase maneuverability. So this machine was really built uh, to be an incredibly fast uh, machine and also incredibly maneuverable. It was also equipped with a bunch of different armaments because of course it's American. So the armament uh, included a tactical armament turret or a TAT, the TAT-140 and what this uh, held is a 30 millimeter cannon inside of it. It was actually on the the uh, bottom of the machine. Uh, they unfortunately, you can't see it in this picture, so I'll try and uh, show you a picture with it on if I can. Uh, it's basically this picture here, if you can see it. And uh, what uh, also now uh, let's just go down a little bit, there you go. And uh, what also uh, was on this machine, or could at least uh, be carried, was it had, as you can see, uh, four sets of hard points uh, on the outer wings. This could carry overall 16 tow missiles, or uh, also AIM-9 sidewinders, or even just the 70 millimeter missiles, the 2.75 inches. Uh, it could carry 76 of them overall, and in the configuration uh, that you can see in this picture here, which is really, really cool. So overall, you've got a ton of different armaments on this, including the 30 millimeter support, but 16 toes is going to make sure that this thing is going to do a ton of damage uh, to anything that it fights. It's another American machine with 16 <laughs> toes designed to annihilate whatever is in front of it. Uh, the, Black Hawk w the Black Hawk was also equipped with two General Electric T-58 GE-5 five engines. This gave it 1500 uh, shaft power uh, 11 at 1100 kilowatts, uh, which is pretty impressive. And this is what the machine looked in flight. It's an incredibly beautiful machine. Uh, normally, uh, helicopters for me, they're not very eye catching. This one is definitely one of those uh, which uh, stands out. Now, another thing about it, as you can tell by the very sleek design and also the way that it was created, it actually uh, set a new world speed record. So on the, on the 19th of December in 1970, the uh, S67 
was supposed to be going at 355 kilometers an hour uh, on a 15 to 25 kilometer journey from Milford to Branford in Connecticut and it actually reached a new world record it beat the record of the Sud uh, Super Freilon and also reached uh, the highest absolute speed of any helicopter at the time the uh, at the wheel uh, was the test pilot Kirk Cannon and in light diving the standard reached uh, the the uh, uh, the speed that was reached, sorry, uh, was a speed of 384 kilometers per hour. And uh, this just shows how uh, imp inc incredibly impressive uh, the, the machine was when it came to its absolute speed. And over a three week, and over a three week period, uh, it actually went on kind of a US tour to basically show it to different areas of the armed forces to kind of like show it off and see if anybody was interested. And they were very impressed with its agility and also the fact that it could uh, do maneuvers up to uh, loads of 3.3 G's which was incredibly good for an aircraft uh, sorry for a helicopter at that time now, uh, Kurt Cannon and uh, Byron uh, Graham were the uh, people who were credited with the S-67's uh, World uh, E-1 speed records on the 14th of December 1970, uh, which was 348.97 kilometers an hour on a 3-kilometer run, and then 355.48 kilometers an hour in uh, 15 to 25 kilometers on the 19th of December 1970. These records remained in place for eight years. So not a long time but you know long enough and unfortunately tragedy struck in 1974 so in 1974 if you don't know uh, there is a, a general or there used to at least be I should say an annual air show at Fernborough and uh, this uh, was a place where you could pretty much just show off you know your uh, vehicles and also uh, whether it be for investors or whether it be for the public just something you know to see at the aviation fair so on the first 1st of September 1974, the prototype crashed uh, during a demonstration flight at the Aviation Fair in Farnborough, uh, Farnborough if you want to say it like that. Uh, the pilot, who once again was Kirk Cannon, uh, had put a very low bearing and hit the ground in a helicopter. The co-pilot, who was Stu Craig at the time, he died instantly, and Cannon succumbed to injuries nine days later. So unfortunately, Kirk Cannon, after setting the speed records, after you know, uh, flying this thing for around about four years at, at this point, uh, made an error, and unfortunately that ended in the prototype just being completely annihilated. The S-67 at that point had completed 598 flight hours, and since there was no concrete prospects for the sale of the vehicle, Sikorsky interrupted the program. So after the prototype was destroyed, they decided, okay, we're done with this. You know, we're, we're just going to leave this uh, to be which is really sad because it came up with a bunch of really you know intricate and interesting ideas but at the end of the day if you can't sell them unfortunately it's never going to go anywhere and that's basically what happened with the s67 uh, which is incredibly sad the next vehicle to have a look at is from war crime mcgee and I'm just going to make sure that I get the resolution right again. There you go. Uh, so yeah, first of all, great name. Love War Crime McGee. I think that's, uh, that's one of the best names I've seen in this. And uh, he's talking about the Kamov KA-29. And this is, of course, a Soviet naval assault helicopter, uh, which is something that you see a little bit of. And uh, the KA-29 uh, was also not just, you know, an assault uh, gunship machine. It was also a transport. It was also a utility helicopter it was one of those uh, jack of all trades machines that we see across the board when it comes to a lot of helicopters so the first thing is it was a heavily armed assault version of the Kamov KA-27 ASW helicopter. It was also created to support amphibious landing operations and also featured a coaxial uh, rotor design. Uh, this eliminated the need for a tail rotor. So you can see that this machine doesn't actually have a tail rotor, just has a bit of a stumpy tail on the back and enables all the power to be used towards producing lift and higher top speed uh, through the elimination of the disintegration 
symmetry of lift, uh, which is pretty cool. The development of the Ka-29 started in 1973, and the first flights took place in 1976, and trials were then completed in 1979, with production beginning in 1984. So from birth to life, 11 years it took for the production of this machine to start. It then entered service in 1985, and is now still in service today. Uh, it's generally uh, seen as a pretty interesting helicopter, but not one that you normally hear of. Obviously, the Soviets have many uh, more designs which people, you know, resonate with. The K-50, the Mi-28, the Mi-24, and so on and so forth. And uh, the difference between the K-27 and the K-29, if you want to tell them apart, is the K-29, it has a larger redesigned cockpit, which has three crewmen in it. It can also carry 16 fully armed troops. It could also be uh, a medical evacu. Uh, it can also take the role of a medical evacuation vehicle. Can carry four stretchers, seven seated casualties, and also medical attendants. It can also carry external loads on a sling uh, with a maximum weight of four thousand kilos. And it has overall around its cockpit and engines about three hundred and fifty kilos worth of armor, which really isn't a lot, uh, if we're being honest about it. The armament of the machine. Uh, when it was uh, standardized was uh, loadouts uh, such as the S5 and the SA rocket pods. It also had submu uh, ignition dispensers. It could carry 23 millimeter gun pods, torpedoes, bombs, Sturm 5s and attacker 5s and also you know other stuff such as a 30 uh, millimeter mount as well. It also features a flexible mount of four-barreled uh, GS uh, HG 7.62 rotary machine guns in a hidden uh, compartment on the right side of the nose and provisions for mounting a fixed to a 4 to uh, 30 millimeter, as we talked about, on the left side pylon. So just basically a fixed gun on the side. It looks very much out of place. I actually want to show it in this picture if I can. Uh, yeah, right, this one right here. <laughs> it just, it's just kind of sad there. Very very similar to the 220mm on the uh, H-34 for the Americans. So yeah, it's uh, it's just one of those uh, where they've just kind of added it on. So yeah, the, the coaxial rotor design also it leads to lower vibrations and also better accuracy than conventional rotor designs. It is uh, very much an interesting, uh, you know, design overall. And as a machine, uh, which, you know, we don't have too many machines like it in game, it would be nice to see. It would obviously be another Soviet machine with a decent amount of firepower behind it. So it does make sense, you know, to throw it into it. So if you're asking how many ATGMs it can carry, it can carry eight overall. It can either, as we said, carry eight Sturms or eight attackers in the configuration you can see in the picture. And uh, on top of that, bombs rock and of course torpedoes. Maybe one day we'll get homing torpedoes. That would be a very uh, interesting time, but any time it may happen. The next one is from Miki Hoshi, and we're back talking about the AH-1Ss, but this time we're talking about the Step 3. Uh, so this is uh, the Japanese uh, AH-1S in a way. So let's go through the uh, different steps uh, so you kind of understand them. So first of all, you have the Bell AH-1, this uh, this actually paved the way for attack helicopter development, not just for America, but also a bunch of other countries. Because of the success uh, that attack helicopters found uh, over Vietnam, the JGSDF, they were interested in a machine, and they actually got themselves two AH-1S Step 2s, which uh, are, of course, AH-1Es uh, for testing. And after successful testing of the vehicle, uh, they were selected for licensed production. And in 1982, the production was locally produced versions of the AH-1 Cobra, and this was underway in the Fuji Heavy Industries, which of course uh, we've talked about many times when talking about Japanese helicopters. So the AH-1S, it was a Step 3 modification uh, which they built, uh, which was licensed produced. It used, it used the Kawasaki T-53K703 turboshaft uh, engines, and uh, since it was a Step 3 modification, the AH-1S 
MS was equipped with composite rotors, flat place glass, a redesigned cockpit layout, and also the M197 20mm cannon in the nose. Also had the M147 RMS heads up display, the infrared exhaust suppressor, and uh, the M143 ADS. The Step 3 uh, AH1S in the US, though, is uh, the AH1F Cobra. Uh, so we've talked about this before how, you know, the different uh, steps and, you know, what it is. But in this case, the Step 2 is the AH1E and the Step 3 is the AH1F. Now, the difference between the AH1S Step 3 in Japanese hands compared to the AH1F, which is, you know, the AH1 Step uh, 3 for the Americans, is the uh, AH1F. H1S Step 3 is lacking certain things. Uh, so it's lacking the infrared jammer, chaff flare dispensers, and also laser rangefinders, which are found on stuff like the H1F. The uh, 73rd uh, production helicopter in 1991 uh, was also, you know, uh, produced by in the Fuji H1S. Uh, Cobra was equipped with a nose-mounted FLIR imaging device known as the CNITE, and helicopters prior to the 73rd production model have also been retrofitted with the C uh, or C Knight or CNITE uh, uh, system. The all the H1Ss in later service as well received intake shields to protect the intake from rocket ingestion and production stretch from 1982 until 2000 with a total of 90 produced overall and the uh, Fuji H1S remains to be the primary attack helicopter of the JGSDF arsenal with 59 flying as of 2017. So this machine is still uh, in active service. Uh, it's still around the place. Actually I'm not sure you know it, it is uh, in active service but I'm just, you know, I'm, <laughs> I, I remember reading before, you know, in a few of the other things. I'm not sure if they've been fully replaced yet. I know that the Japanese are looking for a replacement, but I remember one of the deals that they were looking to do, unfortunately, fell through. So they're probably still in active service, uh, but, you know, don't quote me on that. Anyway, that is the three helicopters uh, that were passed to the developers. Definitely interesting when it comes to the Sikorsky Blackhawk. The K29 looks fun as well, and why not have another AH-1S? I'm sure we're going to have about 50 in the tech tree, even though they're all incredibly similar. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time. I'd just like to thank Ambrosius McClellan, B. Young, Blackie, Chris Giltnane, Daniel Stanton, Jay Wilt, John Ryman, Martinez, Moxie, Super Cacti, Trigger Hippie, Eugene's Terry, and also Elove Goat and Samuel Slick for supporting the channel.